I'm Dan kurtz and this is the Foreign Affairs Interview. The Great Lakes region is becoming the sort of vortex of instability. And the, the great irony is that so much of this is actually being initiated by Rwanda. After the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, Paul Kagame was seen as a hero who had come to the rescue of his people. Since then, the Rwandan president has cultivated this image and the West has been eager to believe it. But for Michaela Rong, a journalist who has covered Africa for decades, cracks in the story became too big to ignore. My colleague Ty McCormick talked to Rong about what her reporting has uncovered, including in a recent essay for Foreign Affairs. Today, Kagame's meddling in Congo has brought Central Africa to the brink of a wider war, and outside powers are doing little to stop it. Michaela, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Foreign Affairs Interview. It's a pleasure. So I want to talk about your new article in Foreign Affairs, Kagame's Revenge, about Rwanda's support for a rebel group that's destabilizing much of the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. But first, I'd love if you could take us back and help us set the stage for how we got here. As a journalist, you covered the Rwandan genocide and its brutal aftermath for the BBC and Reuters. What do you remember thinking about Kagame back then? And how is he seen by the rest of the world? At that stage, I think the feeling was that the Rwandan Patriotic Front had put an end to a genocide, taken control of the country. They were talking the talk of ethnic reconciliation. We were, all of us, very, very aware of the extreme violence, the horror that had preceded their arrival. We'd all seen the bodies. We'd seen the churches and schools where the massacres had taken place. So there was a willingness to give them the benefit of the doubt. And um, as they installed a new government, and it was a government that had Hutu ministers in it, as well as as Tutsis in it, it was a positive impression. And it has to be said that the diplomats who were in place in Kigali were also very positive about them. And also, I think mostly the NGOs that were operating in the area were pretty positive. And what about Kagame himself? I mean, I realize that he was kind of the power behind the throne at that point. He was vice president. But how was he seen by foreign journalists, by Western powers? He he seemed to be very quiet, if anything, a rather retiring, maybe a, a shy figure, um, not somebody who exuded charisma. Often he wasn't someone that you really noticed when he he came into the room. He he didn't have an aura around him. I think now that we've seen a, a personality cult gradually establish itself around him, you're seeing a very sophisticated figure, somebody who wears designer clothing, African designer clothing, and also what are clearly quite expensive suits and sunglasses. And uh, there was really none of that because, of course, the RPF in those days, they were wearing camouflage. And uh, I remember one of the small details that impressed itself on me was um, that he was trying to teach himself how to play tennis. So he used to go and practice his tennis. Um, And I thought that was a a sort of charming detail that he was a sort of leader who was learning some social skills because, of course, tennis is quite a social, social game. So how do we go from that Paul Kagame, uncharismatic but still charming, to the one in your fantastic book, Do Not Disturb, the story of a political murder and an African regime gone bad, the Paul Kagame who's sowing chaos across the Great Lakes region and who's sending hit squads to assassinate his political opponents at home and abroad? Well, I think if you track his career, what you have seen is someone who's come out of the shadows and really emerged as a key player. But he sort of caught people unawares, I think. I'm often impressed by the phrase accidental president. Sometimes Rwandans will refer to him as an accidental president because, of course, he wasn't even meant to be the uh, original leader of the Rwandan Patriotic Front, that rebel movement that set itself up in in Uganda in secret. That was supposed to be Fred Rijema. And Fred really was a charismatic figure who people met and they never forgot him. And his troops adored him. Uh, and journalists sort of fell in love with him. Paul Kagame was not that person. He was the quiet friend who kind of hung around in the background. But I think what you've seen is that he has a bit by bit eliminated all the other key players in the uh, RPF and has emerged as, uh, as, as a sort of dominant 
player. What my book describes is the fact that these uh, these other sort of potential leaders have either been uh, jailed or they've fled into exile, or they've been murdered, as was the case with Patrick Caragaya, former head of intelligence. So I, I think he, he caught people by surprise. And, and it's a story of a, of a leader who, whose capabilities and whose ambitions were grossly underestimated by both those around him, but those also who met him. You write in the book that there came a day when, with a near audible mental ping, I realized I no longer believed most of the key truths upon which Kagame and his army, the RPF, had built their account. What made you realize that maybe you'd misjudged him? And what was that moment like? I think what happened with me, and I think it's happened to quite a few journalists and analysts and diplomats and NGO people who have followed the Great Lakes, is that there's been an accumulation of facts and incidents. And then you know, you're busy writing about other things, analyzing other situations. So you, you don't sort of dwell on them, but the, then there comes a point where you have to sort of sit back and uh, add them all together. And you and there's something about your, your cognitive process that you suddenly realize, oh, okay, I, I misjudged this. Uh, with me, I think there were two key elements, if I can identify them, sort of my wake-up call moments. And one was the murder in Nairobi of, Seth Sandashonga, the former interior minister, Hutu, very impressive man who uh, had been part of Kagame's first post-genocide government. And he was shot in his car in Nairobi on the second attempt. And, and the fact that it was the second attempt meant that it was very, very hard to pretend it had been anything other than an RPF hit ordered from Kigali. And then the, the other incidents, the massacres in the, the, the forests of eastern Congo, in the late 1990s, when you um, saw a, a mass exodus of Hutu civilians from the refugee camps that had established themselves in eastern Congo, fleeing the AFDL rebel movement and the Rwandan army, Kagame's army, and many of them ended up in a place called Tingi Tingi near Kisangani. And we know that there were many massacres there and that it was the AFDL, but also and most Rwandan soldiers killing men, women and children. The evidence of that is absolutely overwhelming. There's been a UN mapping report. It was published in 2010 and it talks about 617 separate incidents. So I think it's it's really impossible to sort of look at that evidence and think, oh, this is um, an inspirational, progressive, former rebel movement that sees power. But there are still people who do look at him that way. I mean, fewer and fewer of them these yeah. days. But I think, you know, why do you think that this image, that old image, has taken so long to fade away? I mean, one thing I find really puzzling reading your book is that Kagame often boasts about his crimes. He comes right up to the point of admitting them for a domestic audience while denying them for an international one. How is it that he still has so many supporters in the West? He's very good at playing that game of, of as you say, and nearly admitting responsibility. And also his message in Kenya, Rwanda is very different from his message in, in English. Um, so um, I think um, he's always really telling his domestic audience that he is going to be ruthless with anyone who dares to challenge him, while at the same time, you know, officially and formally denying responsibility for any, any crimes um, in front of his international uh, audience. I think he gets away with it because there's this massive sense of guilt, a guilt complex uh, abroad, uh, because, you know, the international community didn't do anything to stop the genocide. In fact, if anything, the UN started withdrawing its troops when the genocide started in 1994. But I, I, I do think also there is just, there's this inertia. And I'm aware of that inertia having been an element, you know, in my own character, that none of us like to admit that we got something wrong, especially if, if you're paid to analyze uh, either a journalist, an analyst or a diplomat. But that's your job, is to assess what's going on. And nobody likes to admit that they, they, they were naive, that they, were, they, they fell for it. So there's just this sort of tendency to sort of think, no, 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 well, maybe that happened. Maybe there were reasons for that. You know, maybe there's a good excuse. And then eventually, as I said, there's this mental ping where you think, no, okay, there are no excuses for what happened. You write that one thing I never doubted, not for a second, was that a genocide had occurred in Rwanda in April of 1994. 
But there are many other things that you've come to doubt about the story that most of us think we know about the Rwandan genocide. And part of what you do in the book is begin to set the record straight. What are the biggest holes in that narrative? What gets missed? What gets missed? One of the biggest debates, of course, is um, who brought down the plane in 1994, the plane that was carrying President Juvenal Habyarimana. I was just in France recently, and that, and that seems to be a topic of near obsession amongst the French media. And certainly I was amongst many people who I read the histories that had been written at the time by people who knew Rwanda better than me, and they were all saying it was probably the Hutu extremists within Javier Imana's own administration who brought down the plane because they weren't happy with a peace agreement he had reached with the RPF. And as time went by, more and more people came out of the RPF system and said, no, actually, we did it. And while I was investigating and doing my research for my book, I just had to confront the fact that so many of the key players who are now exiled members, uh, who former high up exiled members of the RPF were saying, of course we did it. You know, I mean, how many times do we have to say it? There's another big question mark about the death of Fred Rijema, the, the charismatic military leader of the of the RPF, how he died. I, I give two alternative versions because I personally don't know. And I was told both of those versions and they both make sense. But I, I ended up saying, I just don't know. So those are the two key issues. But I think one of the reasons why my book has a lot of reference notes, far more reference notes than any other book I've written or published, is because every single chapter in Rwandan history is debated and disputed. And, and this is something, you know, I try to address in my introduction, is that there's an alternative narrative for almost every stage of Rwandan history. And I myself was trying, you know, as I wrote the book, to try and work out what was the most likely course of events. That flows nicely into my next question, which is, in the intro to your book, you write that there are many points in the story in which I honestly don't know what happened. It's refreshing and unusual for a journalist to admit that. And yet everyone who's ever been a reporter knows that there are some stories in which it's just impossible to pin down what happened. Why did you decide to include that line so early in the book? And was there something about the Rwandan context that made it especially important to do so? One of the issues I address in my introduction, and it, it's a controversial point, is that when you meet Rwandans, you're interviewing Rwandans, they will often tell you, be careful because, you know, Rwandans are, are very good at lying. And especially they uh, will often take people like you, i.e. white outsiders, Westerners, foreigners, who don't know the culture. They'll often take you for a ride. So I was always aware of that when I was doing my research. I was also aware of the fact that there were there was this sort of track record of fabricated narratives, of, of forgeries, of documents that can't be trusted, of testimonies that have been changed, you know, uh, and changed uh, more than once. You know, so someone has given testimony, changed that testimony and said, no, I was lying when I said that. And then they've come back and said, no, my original testimony was correct. And that makes interpretation really, really hard. But the reason that I am so open about that is because I wouldn't have written this book if I wasn't aware that I had got it wrong originally. You know, the book was triggered by the murder of Patrick Karagaya, the former head of external intelligence, and, and the realization which followed on from his murder in a South African hotel that I had misunderstood, you know, his movement, the RPF, um, the history of the RPF and the history of his former close colleague, Paul Kagame. So I wouldn't have written the book if I wasn't concerned and fascinated and challenged by the whole issue of how you try and establish the truth of the Rwandan story. So let's let's talk a little bit about Patrick Karagaya, this former Rwandan spy chief turned dissident turned opposition politician in, in South Africa. Why did you pick such a complicated figure as your protagonist? I mean, it seems pretty clear by the end of the book that he may, may well have ordered similar assassinations to the one that ended up taking his own life. What kind of problems did that present as a journalist as you were trying to get to the bottom of this story? Well, if you're going to write nonfiction books and not novels, you are dealing with reality and reality is diverse and multifaceted. 
And I think you're always dealing with anti-heroes. And Patrick Karagaya was definitely an anti-hero. So as you say, he was the former head of uh, external intelligence who, who ended up becoming a distant, going into opposition, fleeing the country, denouncing uh, Paul Kagame as a, as a dictator and a tyrant, uh, and ended up being strangled in, in a hotel room for doing that. I think he sort of represents that, that complexity of a Rwandan history. How has the book been received in Rwanda itself? Has the regime made any effort to engage substantively with it? Or has it responded as it so often does with angry denials? Well, what happened after the book came out was that there was this sort of onslaught of uh, social media abuse because the Rwandan regime uses uh, uh, Twitter very, very actively. I don't know a single African government that uses social media as as knowingly and as carefully as the Rwandans do. And I, there was an onslaught there and I was vilified and sort of denounced as a neo-colonialist, as Patrick Karagai's concubine. Also as a spy, uh, claims made that I uh, was paid to write the book by Ugandan intelligence because, of course, there's a long-standing spat between uh, Rwanda and neighbouring Uganda. But the really astonishing thing was that last year, Kagame was giving a, a very long press conference on Rwandan TV live and he was asked about my book and all of those slurs that I just mentioned he repeated them um, without mentioning um, my name or Patrick Karagaya's name but he he sort of made it clear that he was talking about us and I sort of thought it, for me it was great validation because it meant I knew exactly where those slurs and smears were coming from I had never really doubted that he had ordered those attacks on me but I sort of thought okay I'm hearing it now From the source, (laughs) this is where it's coming from. You write that you've written previous books that annoyed ruling regimes, but have never felt quite so personally at risk as you felt writing this one. Can you say a little bit more about why you felt threatened while you were reporting the book and whether you still feel that way? I do feel threatened. I was just recently in Brussels where I staged several speaking events. I'd been invited by a Pan-African think tank to give a talk at a, an African restaurant, which has a, a room where they stage events. And a very deliberate campaign was started up on Twitter. And it was also taken up on email. And people were calling anonymous phone calls from Kigali. And it, uh, these were all directed at the restaurant where we were supposed to be staging the event to claim that I was a genocide denier, something, as I said in my introduction of my book, I have never denied that there was a, a genocide in in Rwanda, you know, why would I? I reported on it. But that that's one of the slurs that uh, is hurled at me uh, and, and really anyone who criticizes Paul Kagame. And so eventually, you know, the restaurant owner got cold feet, not surprisingly, and cancelled the event. And we moved, I mean, we sort of outsmarted um, the trolls because we, we just moved it to another event in Brussels and the Pan-African think tank, they were very smart. They had three young men sort of checking arrivals and they reckoned there were three people who had been sent to disrupt the event and to either heckle or who knows what they would have done but they made sure they didn't get access to the venue so um this this is routine this happened to other writers other people talking about rwanda this even happens at universities where people go to speak about rwanda there is a a very consistent and very well organized campaign of uh, harassment and intimidation and What's shocking is it, you know, this isn't happening in, in Rwanda or even a neighboring country. This is happening in Belgium. This is happening in France. You know, people are trying to do this in, in the UK, uh, here where I live, in, in the US. It's international. And I think that that's really, I mean, it really illustrated, the incident in Brussels really illustrated the theme of my book, which is this is a, a government which has no compunction and no fear about doing this beyond its own borders. I mean, it, it reaches out well beyond its own territory to intimidate, to harass, to sabotage, and to silence its critics. We'll be back after a short break. You're listening to the Foreign Affairs Interview, brought to you by Foreign Affairs Magazine. Looking for more in-depth coverage of the political, economic, and national security issues shaping our world today? A subscription to Foreign Affairs Magazine gives you exclusive access to thought-provoking essays by the world's leading policymakers, scholars, and thought leaders. Join the global conversation on the issues that matter most. To subscribe to Foreign Affairs Magazine today, 
go to foreignaffairs.com slash subscribe. That's foreignaffairs.com slash subscribe. Speaking of reaching out beyond its borders, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about what's going on in eastern Congo, which is the focus of your recent foreign affairs piece. Can you just tell us a little bit about what's going on there? Well, what's happened recently and what I wrote about in foreign affairs is the uh, M23 movement which is a movement made up of members of the Tutsi minority, Congolese members, has been, well, rampaging, operating in eastern Congo and seizing more and more territory from the Congolese army. And this is a very curious state of affairs. It started last year because, you know, this is a movement that had had gone into, you know, it, it had withdrawn. It was active 10 years ago in the area. It was at the time, 10 years ago, it was well known that Rwanda was supporting this movement because there's a strong allegiance between the Rwandan army and the M23. And it's bubbled up again and become a really big factor in Eastern Congo. And when I say a big factor, the numbers are extraordinary. I mean, we're talking about 800,000 refugees, Congolese villagers who have had to flee their homes. There have been massacres staged in Eastern Congo by the M23. There's lots of arming of local um, militia groups. There's now an Eastern African force, an uh, international force of uh, of soldiers who are intervening because they have been called in by the Congolese government, by Felix Tshishikedi, the president. Recently, Felix Tshishikedi has also asked southern African governments to come to his aid militarily. So what you're seeing is this vortex that the Great Lakes region is becoming this sort of vortex of instability. And the, the great irony is that so much of this is actually being initiated by Rwanda. Uh, We know from a UN mapping report that came out last year that the the M23 are being armed, equipped, and are deploying alongside the Rwandan army. Um, And that one of the points that the UN made was that that it's almost impossible to tell the difference between the Rwandan army and the M23. So uh, this is a, a movement that is supported by Kigali. And yet, you know, despite the fact that America and all sorts of Western countries have, have repeatedly made this link, and called on Rwanda to stop this support, it continues. And we're we're seeing these sort of situation which Eastern Congo has become more and more anarchic. Uh, Goma, the main city, is is virtually surrounded, and there are all these refugees living in camps. So what's Kagame's objective in Eastern DRC? Why risk international condemnation or worse to back the M23? Well, the point I made in my piece for Foreign Affairs is that there was a moment when uh, the president of DRC reached out to Uganda uh, and had signed a deal to basically reconstruct, rebuild the uh, roads between Uganda and Eastern Congo. Eastern Congo, as we know, has got a lot of mineral resources that are of interest and that are exported to the rest of the world. And by signing that deal with Uganda, it basically meant that these goods no longer had to go out via Rwanda. And uh, Rwanda, over the years, has benefited a great deal from all of these mineral riches that are often exported as though they were Rwandan minerals, but everyone knows that they're Congolese. So I think uh, uh, what happened is that President Paul Kagame effectively felt he was being sidelined, he was being marginalised, he doesn't like that, he wants to be the president in the Great Lakes that everyone pays due deference to. And the M23 has been his way of reminding people that he is a player, that he sees himself as a key player, and that if he isn't taken into account and included in the the various deals, he can make life very, very difficult for the, the residents of the Great Lakes. As you write in the piece, this is not the first time that the M23 has threatened Eastern Congo, but the last time this happened in, in 2012, Western countries came down pretty hard on Kagame. They cut aid, they threatened sanctions, uh, and basically forced him to withdraw his support from the M23. Why isn't that happening this time around? This is a very good question. We know that 10 years ago, when the M23 was also very active, the foreign donors and got together and announced sanctions, and that hit Rwanda and its, its budget very hard. That hasn't happened this time, and it's very interesting to examine why it hasn't happened. My own government here in the UK, uh, I think, has played a role in, the fa- in that failure to form a common stance. 
last year we signed a, an asylum deal. Unwanted asylum seekers are supposed to be sent to Rwanda to settle. Um, not a single asylum seeker has yet gone to Rwanda, and there are question marks about whether that will ever happen. But in the meantime, what we're seeing is Downing Street and the Foreign Office here are completely silent on the issue of Kagame's support for the M23. Another big player, of course, is France, and we saw Emmanuel Macron going to Kigali last year, and he, he has sort of mended this, this very unhappy relationship between France and Rwanda that was a result of François Mitterrand's support for juvenile Habyarimana. So he has repaired that relationship. And he, in most analysts think that what we're, what we're seeing is France turning to Rwanda and counting on it for its military support, because increasingly French troops are no longer welcome around Africa. They're not welcome in the Sahel, in Western Africa. We see that French interests have been threatened in Mozambique by a jihadist movement. And the Rwandans are ready to deploy and have done so in the past. You know, they, the, the Rwandan troops have deployed very effectively in Central African Republic, in Darfur, and Mozambique. So I think France is looking to Kagame for that kind of help. And that's the implicit promise. As a result of that, you have a situation which two key foreign allies, two key foreign donors are simply not going to criticise Paul Kagame and and not going to vociferously call on him to halt his support for the M23. Uh, And and that really presents a problem. So although people might have been discussing at a diplomatic level imposing sanctions, uh, nothing has actually been done. And and in that silence, you see this growing sort of unravelling situation in, in Eastern Congo where more and more foreign armies are getting sucked in and there's more and more uncertainty over the future. Yeah, you write that not since 2012 has Africa's Great Lakes region been on such a troubling trajectory, but this time no one is pumping the brakes. What's the danger? What's the worst case scenario if this is allowed to escalate? Well, no one can feel at ease with the situation in which um, more and more African armies are mustering and deploying into a rather small area. And also you've got to think that Eastern Congo for decades now has been an area where there are all sorts of local armed groups. Some of them are just local defence groups. The Mai Mai, uh, these were militias set up to protect local villages, but then in the end they become predatory on the local population. So you've got a lot of armies operating in the area, you've got a lot of rebel groups, and you've got a a lot of local militias. It's just a force for destabilization, and not only of Eastern Congo, because this is going to have spillover effects on all all the neighboring countries. So I think uh, any government that cares about the stability of the African continent and, and Central Africa should be very worried about what's going on in the Great Lakes. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has been one of the lone senior Western officials to really sternly rebuke Kagame about this situation. Is there more the U.S. should be doing to prevent this from spiraling out of control? I think of all the foreign donors, the Americans have been most forthright in their criticisms of Kagame and in terms of ramping up the rhetoric and sort of saying, um, you know, we know what you're doing and you need to stop. One of the concerns, though, for outside observers is that the Americans were bothered about two issues in particular. One of them was the kidnapping and jailing and sentencing of Paul Rusa Sabagina, the former hotel manager who is a U.S. resident and whose family managed to wage um, a really impressive campaign to get him freed. And the other was the M23 and Kagame's support for the M23. And the Americans have been vocal on both those issues. Uh, and what you saw fairly recently was that Rusa Sabagina was freed and flown back to the States and has been reunited with his family. So one of the question marks is whether by removing Rusa Sabagina's detention from the, from the game, whether that means that the Americans will now scale back their rhetoric, be less critical of Kagame and his support for the M23, whether that move by Kigali will will go some way to repairing the relationship. What I hear from my American contacts is that um, there is a sense of profound disillusionment in Washington with uh, Paul Kagame's regime, with his administration, with um, the role it's playing in particular uh, in destabilizing the Great Lakes so that 
the freeing of uh, Paul Rusa Sabagina is, is not going to do enough to repair that relationship. Um, anyway, that's what I've been hearing. But I think time, time is going to tell because there had been talk of imposing sanctions on Rwanda for what, its support of uh, the M23. And what we've seen is there are no sanctions. So uh, that does raise a, a major question mark. How will the presidency of Paul Kagame end? He's been in power for 30 years, but he's only 65 on a continent where many leaders are over 80. Is there a world in which he steps down or will he be president for life? Or is there a third option? Could someone like Karagaya from the exiled opposition ever mount a credible challenge to his regime? Well, there's definitely an active opposition. It's active abroad because at home it's impossible for the opposition to mobilize. The most important head of the opposition, a woman called Victoire Ngabire, is under house arrest at home, having spent eight years in prison. So she can't really meet her supporters. And I doubt that she'll be able to run in future elections because she spent time in prison. So I don't think we're we're likely to see Paul Kagame bowing out anytime soon. I mean, one of the problems with someone of his kind is that they there has been so much bloodshed and so many atrocities attributed to his regime. I mentioned the UN mapping report of 2010, that if he were ever to stand down, the question then becomes, as with Putin, will he face prosecution before an international tribunal? So that's a, a real disincentive to standing down. I think that's probably a good place to end. So thanks, Michaela. Thanks for that. And thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening. You can find the articles that we discussed on today's show at foreignaffairs.com. The Foreign Affairs interview is produced by Kate Brannon, Julia Fleming Dresser, and Molly McEnany. Special thanks also to Grace Finlayson, Caitlin Joseph, Nora Revenaugh, Asher Ross, Gabrielle Sierra, and Marcus Zacharia. Our theme music was written and performed by Robin Hilton. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please take a minute to rate and review it. We release a new show every other Thursday. Thanks again for tuning in. 